couple of weeks, we've been on this journey together as a family, exploring God's design for the phone, for the phone, <laughs> for the home. <laughs> None I've ever owned, if only. But God, we've been for this past several weeks exploring God's design for the home in the book of Ephesians in a series that is a sub-series within the book as we're studying our way through the entire book. Uh, it's called Family Matters. Well, when we got to Family Matters, the first thing we did is that we looked at the relationship between husbands and wives, and that was uh, extremely powerful, uh, I believe, because it, uh, it has had an impact on me, a great impact. And last week, we transitioned to the relationship between parents and children. And we started last week with the first part of that, that the passage addresses first, and that is we, the, a word to children. You may remember the three verses that we looked at last week. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Now, if you'll remember, before you keep reading there, that, that the word children was, a, was the broadest term possible in the Greek language for Offspring, not just, we, we, all, we automatically mentally go to the children upstairs. And so we looked last week at how this, that passage applies not to just young children that are still in the home, but those who have grown and are gone, and how we still interact and how the, those requirements still apply to us if your parents are living. But children, that means just offspring, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may be, live long on the earth. Well, today we move on from there to the next verse, verse, just the next single verse, and we're calling it a word to parents. In verse 4, we read this, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As with the last segments we've been looking at, there is a lot of misinformation out there. There is a lot of misinterpretation. There is a lot of intentional twisting of these passages as they have to do with family that people, I believe some accidentally and some intentionally twist these passages. Uh, those that are doing intentionally to support some twisted version of a family structure that they want to promote. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But please remember this passage. If, you're, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the book of Ephesians, remember that Paul is writing to Christians. He's writing to followers of Jesus who are, who, who are, who are supposedly, or, or at least uh, uh, assumably, trying to live in the fullness of the Spirit and pursue God's best for their lives and those around them. So it's, it's, a, it's a very applicable statement for us that we see here in verse 4. But not everybody's seeking God's best. I understand that. We live in a broken world. And not everyone gets to live in a home where everyone is following, is a follower of Jesus and seeking God's best and trying to live in the fullness of the Spirit. I get that. But let me just give a little sidebar here. If you're living in a situation that is not characterized by followers of Jesus, seeking to live in the fullness of the Spirit and, and desiring to pursue God's best, and you're living in a situation that's abusive, I can guarantee you that is not God's design and that is not God's desire for you. If someone in your home is trying to use a scripture to justify abuse, they are 100%, intentionally or not, they are 100% misinterpreting the Word of God. Because an, an abusive situation and the will of God are never compatible with one another. Amen? And if you are in an abusive situation, we want to help. We have the privilege of being connected to the main campus. And through that campus, we have some amazing resources that we can plug you into. All you have to do is tell me and I'd be glad to help. Okay, back to where we were. 
Remember also what we saw back in chapter 5, verse 21, where it says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. If you'll remember, this verse is like an umbrella over everything that follows in these different relationships. This applies to all the relationships in the book after it. We started with husbands and wives, and now we're dealing with children, and it'll move on from there. But in every instance, this is to apply to both sides of these relationships, that we are to be subject to one another. And what that means is that in every way that I interact with you, talking about these two different relationships, whether it's husband and wife, whether it's parents or children, that we consider, as the Bible says in Colossians, others to esteem them more highly than ourselves. In other words, we think of others more importantly than ourselves. I mean, stop and think about that simple arrangement. The difference that can make in any relationship, husbands, wives, parents, children, employees, employers, anything, when we think of others as more important than ourselves. Because as I've said before, a couple weeks ago, what we normally do is we think of ourselves more important than others. And so we see everything through the, through the lens of this, if it affects me negatively, has to change. Now, while a lot of things affect us, they're not all about us. <laughs> You are, you, nor am I, you and I are not the center of the universe. No, you're not. <laughs> and the Bible tells us that we are to think of others more highly than ourselves. We are to think of others as more important than ourselves. And when a relationship has that, especially on both sides, even if it's from one side, it sweetens the relationship, but from both sides, it's a game changer. And you may remember from last week, we, we've had defining statements about how this applies to the different sides of the relationships, how it applies to husbands, how it applies to wives. Last week, how it applies to children. And today, we'll, we'll look at that one again just very briefly. The, the uh, defining statement for children from last week is that children, you are to demonstrate Christ-like submission by honoring your parents, recognize them, recognizing them as God's gift to you throughout the seasons of your life. Well, this week we are switching to parents. So the defining statement for parents is, parents, you are to, demonst to demonstrate Christ-like submission by nurturing and shepherding your children, recognizing them as God's gift to you throughout the seasons of your life. And so today, just like last week, we are going to answer two questions from our passage. And in fact, we're in the same relationship, so we're going to ask and answer the same questions even. The first of the two is, who is he talking to? Well, just like last week, it said children, and it seemed obvious. But it wasn't quite so obvious because children, that broad term for children, applied to young children still in the home and to older children that are not in the home anymore. And they apply differently, but it still applied to both. And today you may be thinking, well, he started out the verse by saying fathers. Isn't that an obvious answer? Well, the word fathers there, the, the Greek word, is most often what you think. A father. It even refers to God sometimes, this word. But it's also translated, like in Hebrews 11.23, as the word parents. So it's a broader term than just fathers. In fact, Hebrews 11.23 says this, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for... Now you may remember that, the, that Pharaoh was worried about the, the, the Hebrew people growing in numbers to the point where they could overtake Egypt. And so he commanded that all the uh, young male children, the, the male children being born, were, were to be thrown in the Nile, in the river. But Hebrews 11.23 hearkens back to what his parents did. He said, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. There in Hebrews, the New Testament book of Hebrews, it's the same word as fathers here in our passage. He was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. Now, I don't know what that had done if it had been an ugly cuss, but, <laughs> but we'll just go with what actually happened. 
And it's the same word in our verse, fathers, translated in Hebrews as the word parents. So, why would Paul use this term and not a term that would clearly mean and demonstrate the idea of parents, either one? Well, because it is God's design that fathers have the responsibility and the burden, if you will, to make sure that their family lives in the will and the ways of God. Am I saying that moms don't have a role there? No, I'm not saying that. And, and in fact, in a lot of families, it is, a, it is mom who is making sure that happens. But that doesn't change the design that God gave us to begin with. So do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. God's ideal design for the family is a husband and wife who both love Him and love each other. With a biblical definition of love, I would add. And in this ideal design, the Father is given the primary responsibility of being the spiritual leader in the home for discipline and instruction. But let me say this. I know we don't all live in ideal homes. Because we don't live in an ideal world. One of the effects at the fall is that home is not always ideal. Some of you are single parents, working your fingers to the bones, striving to do the job that takes two people. And making a valiant, honorable effort at it. But understand this principle applies to all parents, regardless of your situation, because this, the, the, here's the point I'm trying to make. And this just ha, ha, has, an, ha, has quite an impact. God, in His grace, can take your situation. Sometimes we think that these are principles that look good on a shelf. But we think, that couldn't apply to me. Because look at the junk I have to live with. Look at the life I have to live. Look at the stuff I put up with. Look at, look at how unbiblical my life is. So while that's some ideal thing up on a shelf that look, looking pretty, it can't apply to me. No, it does apply to us. God is not unaware of the fallenness of this world. God, in His grace, can take your situation and accomplish His purpose in the life of your children if you will honor His plan. God in His grace can take your situation, whatever that is, whatever that is, and accomplish His purpose in the life of your children if you will follow His plan. My goodness! Is that not the, the heart cry of every born-again parent that God would work in their children His purpose? Wow, I wish I had that in my, when I was growing up. I wish my parents had had God's desire and, and God's purpose in my life as I was growing up. Because once again, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. Man, I wish I'd been raised in the households that some of you are raising your children in. I'm going to try to say this in a way that's not wrong. <laughs> I envy that. Even at my age, I envy the upbringing that your children are getting that I didn't have. Well, the second question... Just like last week, what is he saying? Well, Paul starts with a word about what parents should not do. He says, fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to anger. The, the, the phrase do not literally means don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. And the word provoke to anger means to, to well, obviously to make angry to, uh, and to provoke or to irritate. But there's another word that we use that I think captures the meaning, and that is to exasperate. 
to, to cause angst in our children where they think things like, I'll never get it right. Or all he does or all she does is criticize. Or he'll never love me. To provoke or to exasperate a child means causing them to think things like that. And I'm going to get real practical here. Some of the ways that parents sometimes exasperate their children is by overprotection. Showing favoritism. Not communicating their value to them. You know, if, you, if those of you who remember... Oh, and by the way, Wednesday night, family night... Wow. We're averaging 125 Sunday mornings now. We had right at a tad over 100 people in the building Wednesday night for family night. Yeah. And, and, and part of that was 44 people here for the Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage seminar. And, and, and so I'm, I'm saying all that to say this. I'm going to hearken back to one of the lines that Mark Gunger used, the one that's hosting that seminar, the video part, portion that we watch. And that is, you know, why I was sometimes saying, well, you never tell me you love me. And that, that is a chronic problem from what I understand. And, and um, his illustration was, he said, well, I told you that when, I, when we got married. If anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> You know, that's not how it is. And that's not how it is with, with children either. They need to hear that. They need to hear that constant affirmation from us because they so desperately crave it. But setting unrealistic goals. You know, I'll be honest. I, I don't know if my parents ever really had goals for me until I did something that didn't reach them. <laughs> you know, can anybody relate? Failing to show affection. I had three of the, when we get to the bottom of this list, I, I, I had basically four of these growing up. And that was one of them. It just wasn't the thing to do with, with dads of my father's generation. Not providing for their needs. I don't think that happens here. But it does happen. A lack of standards and boundaries. If your children, if, if the goalpost is always being moved, your children never know when, what to aim for and when they get there. Unnecessary criticism. You know, sometimes people like to criticize others just because they can when it doesn't serve any constructive purpose. When we have conversations with one another, if somebody has a slip of the tongue, and you know what they meant, and they, but you, 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 you interject to make sure and correct them because what they meant was not what they said. That doesn't serve any constructive purpose, but it does hurt. It does poison the water of a relationship. Comparing them to others. They're not somebody else. If I've learned one thing being here at this church for the last five years, that I'm no good at being anybody but me. <laughs> and when I try, it's no good. It just doesn't work. So you, this is all you get. <laughs> Excessive or inconsistent discipline. But thankfully, although there are a lot of things that we do that exasperate children, thankfully the passage goes, that verse goes on to tell, tell us what to do instead of what just not to do. It says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. To bring them up means to nurture, to look after them and to provide for them and care for them until they're independent. And this is the bring them up phrase is in the present tense. And you, most of you probably know what that means. In the, in the Greek, it means that it's something that is always happening. It would be like me saying, my name is Don. That's present tense because my name is still Don, even though it's later. And my name is still Don, even though it's later. Being in the present tense means that it's always true or that you are to always be doing it. So to bring them up in the to bring them up is 
is what parenting looks like, as those of you who raised your hands know. But verse 4 gives us two ways to do this, to bring them up. First of all, discipline means training that includes appropriate punishment. Punishment is not a popular thing these days. Except with God, because it helps us to know how to be right. I mean, we wouldn't even want a society where people aren't punished for wrongdoing. Just think if there were suddenly, the, 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 instead of there being laws about speeding on the books, and if you get caught, then there's a punishment that's related to that. The, the law stays on the book, but the punishment just gets thrown out. And, and all the crimes that, that people are punished for, you know, it has a correcting effect for most, <laughs> as it does with children. But he also tells us instruction and that means a, an admonition, a cautionary warning a, a, about the wrong course of action that's going to hurt them in the long run. Spiros Zodiates, one of the, he's no longer alive, but he's one of the all-time uh, authorities on the understanding of Greek. Well, he was Greek for one thing, but he spent his entire life studying the Greek language and... Um, he says this, he says, any word of encouragement or reproof that leads to correct behavior. That's what instruction of the Lord is. Any word of encouragement or reproof that leads to correct behavior. Well, I want to give you an everyday life application here of this, of, of this verse, these two things. Hopefully this is motivation for you. Your relationship with your children is the training ground for their relationship with God. Last week I talked about that a little bit. And two of you, it's hard to have a conversation at the door when we dismiss and people are leaving and going by for meals and stuff. But even in that little bit of short little time that we had there and, and the chaos of it, two people came up to me and said the same thing that I said from the pulpit, that my dad, when I was being raised in... Now, I had, a, I had a better home than a lot, don't get me wrong, but it was not a spiritually guided or characterized by godliness type home. My father left the impression upon me that made it... left an impression upon me that made it really hard for me to think that God loves me like he does because my dad didn't seem to love me and you know he, he didn't hate me he didn't abuse me or anything like that but I but I never really felt like my dad loved me until I was in my 20s you want to hear something sad dads don't let this happen to you the first time I remember openly saying to my dad I love you because I'd never seen it modeled was when he was in a coma and I was in my 20s. And I don't know if he knew I was there or not. And it was still hard to do. It still took me, I was nervous, my heart was beating fast just to tell my dad I loved him because I so desperately wanted to hear it from him. But of course I wasn't going to, he was in a coma. He came out of that. From that point forward, one of the easiest things in the world to say, love you daddy. He said, I love you too. We finally got past it. But it was way too late. Way later than it should have been. Let me put it that way. But your relationship with your children is the training ground for their relationship with God. They need to know what a relationship like, with God is like because you model it with them. Because you're laying that foundation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, he said, It is from God that parents receive children, and it is to God that they in turn ought to lead them. Wow. And it said so beautifully in the book of Deuteronomy, this, you shall love the Lord. Now you'll remember this part, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He, shall, he, said, he quoted this, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one is like that, you love your neighbor as yourself. 
But the first, and as Jesus said, the most important commandment was the first portion of this passage. He says, you shall love the Lord God with all your, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you will lie down and when you rise up. Now, this doesn't mean that this is only to be communicated to sons, but what it means is that the fathers were given the responsibility to make sure that the family lives in the will and the ways of God and they had the responsibility of making sure that the next generation of dads were equipped to do the same. And so they did so by making sure that they taught these things to their sons so that the next generation... And you know, we're, we're generationally motivated here so this is right up our alley. But the word, the word talk here, it just means common conversation. Common conversations, everyday stuff. Barry Schaefer says this says, God wasn't picturing an occasional devotional moment or a quick pre meal pr prayer. God's words were to be intentionally impressed on the younger generations as they were woven into the fabric of everyday life. Um, and how to train your kids through doing life? Well, let me give you something that I apparently don't have on the board. It's there in the verse. After the word talk. As you sit in your house. <laughs> that's not an event. I mean, that's, that's not a... It's just the opportunity looking for teaching moments. Because as you live lives characterized by desiring to live in the fullness of the Spirit and pursuing God's best, as you do that, it's just simply telling your children as you do so and explaining what you're doing. It's already in us when we do these things and we are to, in a very conversational way, share it with them. Or, it says, as we walk by the way, as when you're on the go and you do things like you, you, you give the money back to the person behind the counter that gave you too much change you, you tell your children why you do things like that and you're driving down the road and you're driving the speed limit even though everybody's passing you up and you, and you tell them why you're doing things like that or not <laughs> and there when you lie down the idea there is at the end of the day and then at the, when you rise up at the beginning of the day, it's just woven into the everyday fabric of life. And, and here's a liberating truth. The greatest lessons you'll teach your children will not be in a formal setting, but in the informal activities of daily life. You don't have to structure some amazing teaching moments and, and, and all that. You just have to simply live for Jesus and tell your children as you do so. That's not hard. I'm going to give you two keys to shepherding the heart of a child in this, in this way. Click, 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 click. <laughs> two keys to shepherding the heart of a child. One, you set an example. You notice I said, as you live following Jesus, pursuing God's best, the greatest thing you can do for your children is to love Jesus and walk with Him daily. One of the worst things you can do for your child is to push religion down their throat with you not living what you're preaching. Because like it or not, parents are still the most influential person in a child's life. And after all, remember what Deuteronomy said, it said, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. Then it says, You shall teach them diligently. You will not very effectively teach something that you're not modeling. Secondly, set boundaries. 
Your children don't need buddies. They need bound- well, they do need buddies, but that's not your role as a parent. You know, and, and get this. Let me let me try to explain something very quickly here. There's a difference between loving your children, which means basically doing that which is best for them under all circumstances, and having a relationship with your children that is conditional. A lot of relationships are like this. I will love you as long as you do that which makes me feel good about myself. And if you jump off the tracks with that, well, I discard you because you no longer, you no longer feel my needs. That's, that's about self, not others. And so to, to set boundaries, it's, it's hard because kids act like they don't like it. How many of you had... I had boundaries. <laughs> How many of you had boundaries in your life? Pretty substantial boundaries, and you understood. Okay. Do you now regret it? I don't. I'm glad I was given boundaries. But some parents will, will withhold instruction that causes difficulty in the relationship in the moment. And see, that's not loving the child, that's wanting to feel good about yourself. You're wanting the child to adore you like they do their friends. But that's not in their best interest. That's not love, or that's not loving the child. It's more about feeling good about yourself. I'm my child's friend. But to give them boundaries, when they grow up, they will appreciate it. I know I do. They will thank you for it even. Well, the problem is that we have to be willing to live with the children being unhappy with those boundaries if we want them to grow up to be godly adults and parents. Max Anders says this, Christian fathers should be sure their children are as sure of their love as they are of their authority. They need to know that you love them. Because, quite honestly, rules without a relationship equals rebellion. So, how do we respond to God's Word here today? First of all, I'm going to harken back to last week a little bit. Those of you who are children, not children children, but just offspring, if your parents are still living, Is your relationship with Jesus evident in the way you obey your parents, talk to your parents, respond to your parents, listen to your parents, or honor your parents? Is your relationship, the way you interact with your parents, does it tell them and others that are watching that you're a follower of Jesus? If you're a parent here today, is your relationship with Jesus evident in the way you talk with your children, the way you listen? to your children, the way you resolve conflicts with your children, the way you discipline them, the way you encourage them. If not, these are really good places to start. Let's pray and then we'll move on. Lord, this isn't always, this stuff isn't always easy to hear. God, not only do we live in a culture and a world that is uh, sometimes the antithesis of your will and your ways. But God, just our own fallen nature causes us to want to do things our ways, whether we are the child or whether we are the parent, whether we are the husband or whether we are the wife. So God, I pray that you, through the Holy Spirit, that you, Holy Spirit, would indeed convict us on the inside Help us to know on the inside that these things not only are true, but these things work. And they work well. Lord, help us to recognize when our fallen nature or the influence of our culture is contrary to your will and your ways. So that we might then come to that point of conflict and say, I choose you, O God because you love me. Help us, Lord, to be good parents. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen.